Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Power Monkey Podcast. We have one of the great former gymnasts of all time with us today, Jake Dalton. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Jake's. I've watched his career over the years uh, and to see what he's done, uh, both as a, at a collegiate level and then part of Team USA, and now what he's doing outside of the gym, uh, not as an athlete anymore, has been so impressive to watch. I know you guys are going to get a lot out of this podcast. Before we jump over to Jake and start asking some questions and see what's going on, I want to give a little bit of a background on who he is. Jake is a two-time Olympian, 2012-2016 U.S. Olympian. He's a four-time world medalist. He's also a four-time NCAA champion uh, as part of the team uh, from University of Oklahoma. And uh, he is 28 years old, and he's actually stayed very active within the gymnastics community even after uh, having retired. So, Jake, welcome to the podcast. Really excited to have you on board. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Looking forward to it. So uh, just to give everybody a little bit of a background on your gymnastics and kind of where you came from, can you tell people kind of where you started, when you started, and kind of how you got into the sport? Yeah, I grew up out in uh, Reno Sparks, Nevada, and uh, did a lot of sports when I was younger. And I ended up going to a, a baseball camp, actually, and uh, I was trying to be a pitcher when I was younger. So the baseball coach said I should do some gymnastics and would help my pitching arm. So that's kind of how I got involved with gymnastics and uh, – after that, just started competing and ended up quitting baseball and sticking with gymnastics. So just grew up out here in Sparks and Reno, Nevada doing that. And uh, yeah, just kind of kept with it. <laughs> well, I love that a baseball coach knew the importance of setting a foundation around gymnastics and how that would go on to help you with anything else you wanted to go do. Maybe he's a little bit upset that you went on to do great <laughs> things in gymnastics, but that's a smart baseball coach right there. Well, yes, I'm very... Yeah, I'm, yeah. I was going to say I'm very impressed that that somebody actually <laughs> recommended that. I'm I'm only a little upset that they didn't tell you to do some weightlifting along with that, Jake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm now that I think about it, it's uh, pretty amazing. Especially you know, I feel like gymnastics has evolved over time, and it's become kind of known that it's a it's a good sport for just overall athleticism. But uh, yeah, it was was uh, pretty cool that he did that back in the day. And how old were you when you started, Jake? I was about five. Okay, and. I mean, your family have owned a gym for quite some time now. That was not part of the, the kind of family business when you were growing up, huh? It came a little bit later down the road. Yeah, definitely. Um, my, neither of my parents ever did gymnastics. You know, my dad, they owned a, a, like a cement plant basically where we lived, and my mom worked at a high school. And um, once I got more competitive, my sister was in gymnastics. We were both competing, and – um, we moved a little bit closer to the gym, so my, my family sold their business, and my mom was kind of looking for a job, and she ended up working at the gym because she was there so much, and uh, eventually the, the owner was looking to sell it, and so they kind of just dove right in and became a, a family business and a family affair. Awesome. Very, very wow. cool. Yeah, that's very, very cool as well, and um, you know, you mentioned the others, uh, playing other sports as a kid and then getting into gymnastics and kind of quitting everything else. What was it about gymnastics that that stuck with you why did you stick with gymnastics i just i think it's because i get bored pretty easy um so gymnastics there's so many different skills that you can learn you know you've got six events plus you've still got trampoline to kind of play on you've you've got thousands of skills on every event so it was i think it was going to the gym every day and the possibility of being able to learn something new uh is what just was so exciting you know even when you're at one level there's so many skills you have to learn and mm -hmm. then you're trying to prep for the next level so just always having something new to learn and kind of chasing another achievement was uh i think something i i loved since i was a little kid for sure and ultimately going to the olympics in 2012 and 2016 as an olympian i know you get probably the same few questions over and over again i know i get them when somebody finds finds out that i went to the olympics it's like you know, oh, wow, that's awesome. It must have been a really cool experience. That's what I get all the time. Like, yeah, it, it was, but it's more. there's more to it than that. You know, what was it like or, or even how did you do? What are a few of those common questions that you get and, and how do you answer those? Yeah, definitely. Uh, typically, it's, you know, how were the Olympics? Was it awesome? And, I, you know, I'm with you. The same, the same exact answer is yes, it was it was awesome and I loved every minute of it, but it's also extremely stressful. You know, you're, yeah. you're there to do your job and uh, you're stressing about competition and there's all these other things kind of pulling at you with whether it's media or uh, just you're trying to get used to the Olympic Village. Um, mm -hmm. I know in London, one of our 
our apartments ended up flooding. So we had to move, mm. you know, the night before we competed. So there's just a lot going on, uh, during the whole time, but it's, you know, now that you look back on it, it was an absolute blast, but yeah, when you're there, it's definitely a little bit stressful. Yeah. Those, those opening ceremonies, they're, they're cool to say that you went, but uh, they're a little rough on the athletes, I'd say. Yeah, we actually, we end up skipping those as, uh, the gymnastics team, we compete the next morning. And so we actually just, we got dressed and we watched it on TV, yeah. but we actually didn't attend the, the opening ceremonies. We did get to do closing in uh, 2016, which was cool, but uh, yeah. usually we skip the opening ceremonies because like you said, it goes so late. Yeah. The, the, the closing is where it's at for sure. That's where the, the party and the fun happens anyway. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the stress is over by then and it's time to relax and have some fun. So, so Jake coming from the gymnastics world, we get a lot of kind of weird questions, a lot of weird things that people kind of think we do, whether that's, you know, wave ribbons around the way Will Ferrell did in, <laughs> in old school or, you know, uh, those kind of things. You get any weird questions about like what it is to be a gymnast and kind of the things that you actually do out on the floor? Um, not, not too much. Maybe when you're a little bit younger, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Mostly it's just, uh, how is it? What do you guys do? What events it is? Uh, you know, the, the most common one is probably like, oh, how do you do the balance beam? Like, well, <laughs> I, I don't. So <laughs> it's uh, that's that's the women's event. So that's probably the, the funniest one that people come up, come over and are asking about. Was it a yeah. was it a struggle at all when you were a kid doing a sport like gymnastics? Did you get any pushback, you know, leaving a sport like baseball or any other kind of those those, you know, major sports that, that kids kind of do when you're a little kid and go on to more of a niche sport like gymnastics? Do you have any? Uh, any issues from other kids or any, any, any problems doing a sport like gymnastics? Oh, of course. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think, uh, <clears throat> probably almost every gymnast, if you're at a young age where other kids don't really understand the, the sport very well, they just think it's, you know, it's kind of a girl sport or you have to just run around in tights or something, you know, where they're kind of un uneducated about the sport. You're kind of getting, you know, what, whether it's bullied or whatever, until they can kind of figure out you can do backflips, which are pretty cool. And then uh, about the time of high school, people kind of start realizing this kid looks pretty strong. He can do backflips. That's pretty cool. But yeah, definitely when you're in elementary school, you know, it's it's a lot of uh, laughing, thinking it's a girl sport. But uh, you just kind of try and ignore those guys and stick with your buddies that, that understand the sport for sure. And think, it helps when uh, gymnastics helps you be good at other sports on right, the playground. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, but I, th I think that's kind of changing a little bit, right? It seems like it seems like today people starting to recognize the value of gymnastics and how cool it is and um, I'm hoping that the next generation of kids growing up won't have to go through that as much and kind of be looked at as like, oh, wow, you guys can actually do some pretty cool shit. Yeah, D Dave, yeah, can that's, you? That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah, for, for sure. Dave, I always uh, like hearing the story about you getting um, text or phone calls from your former friends that used to pick on you. Oh, yeah. That now want you to teach them how to do a muscle up. Or yeah, whatever yeah. Else, all the, but... all the, you know, the jocks from high school that used to pick on me. And I was tiny in high school, too. I was like under five foot for most of high school. And, uh, you know, I just got picked on mostly in joking. Like it really didn't bother me so much. Yeah. But now they're all doing CrossFit and they're all like, oh, I'm so sorry. Could you help me do muscle up? It's like, no, no, I'm <laughs> yeah. really sorry. I can't. Uh, I yeah, remember. I'd... Good luck. I got, I got oh, actually go like pushed up. I wore this shirt one time in high school. It said, you know, if gymnastics were easy, they call it football. And oh. uh, <laughs> just as a joke, just as a joke. And uh, one of the dudes on the football team actually went to go play on the, in the NFL for the Giants. And um, he was enormous, just like just a massive human being. And uh, I remember him like picking me up and like putting me up against the locker, like lifting me like five feet off the ground and just being like, what is this shirt? I was like. Uh, I don't know why I wore this. <laughs> Somebody else put this on me. I apologize. <laughs> that was my That's attempt awesome. at some, uh, you know, some getting back at those other guys, but I'll never forget that. That's awesome, Dave. That's I, I love that you did that. And this conversation <laughs> has given me a really good idea, by the way. One of our next bets, if, if you lose, Dave, I think I'm going to have you do the uh, ribbon performance there in the middle of every, everyone at camp. Oh, so, I actually have yeah. ribbons here because Sadie is an aspiring rhythmic gymnast. And um, my daughter gets the ribbon all, out all the time. So um, I make sure there's no cameras rolling. And I, um, I do my Will Ferrell impression in my living room well, quite often. That's good to know that you oh, got yeah. that routine ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll, ready we'll, 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 we'll be getting that going for sure. <laughs> all right. So, so Jake, now uh, with kind of like – 
more people doing CrossFit. Obviously, it's become such a phenomenon over the mm -hmm. past decade or so, and a lot more people being interested in gymnastics. Um, what do you notice any specific roadblocks or things that maybe might be some sticking points for people learning some gymnastics movements that you notice? I mean, you do some of this stuff yourself. Uh, anything that you notice when you come in contact with these athletes that are maybe adults now learning these things for the first time? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is just flexibility. You know, uh, it goes back to everybody thinking flexibility or, oh, can you do the splits? And it's like, it's not just splits, right? It's like, can you, can you straighten your legs, bend over and touch the ground? You know, that'll help with a press handstand. Um, you know, your wrist flexibility for muscle ups. Can you get a good false grip on those rings to be able to do the muscle up? Uh, handstands, you know, opening your shoulders and your lats for a handstand. I think that's a, that's a huge key component that a lot of people think of these gymnastics movements in CrossFit and they want to try them. And if they're not flexible or they're, they're not very mobile in those, um, parts of their body, it either limits them or that's when they start to get injured. Um, but I think flexibility plays a pretty big role cause it's not all strength, right? You need to be able to be flexible and get into those positions to be able to do the, the skills correctly. And as a gymnast, uh, with your training, how often would you work on your flexibility and your mobility? We did, we'd obviously stretch and warm up for about 20 to 30 minutes every time we would have practice. And sometimes we were doing two a days for four, four to five days a week. So, you know, that's 20 to 30 minutes right before practice. Um, I'm even stretching on every event that I'm going to, because there's certain elements on the event that I have to stretch for specifically. And then after practice, you're stretching for about another 20 to 30 minutes usually. So, you know, you're getting probably an hour, hour and a half just of, of stretching every day, basically. Right. So as, as an elite athlete, obviously you have the time you're, you're dedicating your life. You're spending, you know, hours and hours in the gym each day, whether that be <clears> one or two days, uh, two days. Um, but it seems like the amount of time is critical, but even more, you're saying four to five days a week, the consistency of being able to do it day in and day out is just as important as the amount of time that you're actually spending on the mobility. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm obviously not training four to five hours a day anymore, um, I try to hit the gym about six days a week, but I'm still going in there and spending the first 10 to 15 minutes every day stretching. You know, it's not the hour, hour and a half I used to do, but I also don't have to get into extreme positions like I used to. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just stretching and keeping my mobility and trying to get my body, you know, ready for workout. And, um, you know, you'll see people just walk right on into the gym and just go hit bench press or just go start squatting. And I just, mm. I just feel so much better. If I stretch, I can hit those positions better and my body doesn't hurt as bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely agree. You mentioned a couple of uh, weightlifting movements there. Well, bench press isn't a, a weightlifting movement for, for sport specific weightlifters. We call weightlifting uh, or what people know as Olympic lifting, we call weightlifting, but, um, right. you know, absolutely agree that that flexibility mobility is the most common roadblock the first thing that people need to look at and, and address. And in that regard, for these people that are interested in getting into more gymnastics, even weightlifting, you know, what would your specific recommendation be? Or maybe just your, your first go-to quick one or two recommendations to help someone get started along that path. In terms of, of flexibility or just getting started? Yeah, I mean, either or, you know, uh, get, getting started in general, but especially since flexibility is is usually the the first roadblock for people yeah um you know first i would say just the, like you said getting started is is finding a gym that's they're going to be focusing on things like that like flexibility and mobility rather than just jumping right into those movements with weight um, that was something that well, i was nervous about i didn't want to go somewhere and just start throwing weight on and i don't know how to do the movement correct you know you, that's just how you get hurt but uh um, the flexibility is, you know, I kind of just look at what movements I'm going to and what body part I need to, um, you know, warm up or stretch, you know, so if I'm going to do squats one day, you know, I'm going in there and I'm stretching everything from hamstrings to quads to, to my glutes, my lower back. And, um, it, you know, cause I, I can feel when I squat, my legs get tight, my back starts to hurt. And if I'm not stretching and rolling out, then, um, you know, then I'm kind of in pain because everything tightens up. And if you're tight in your legs that can pull your hips and your back and make every, every other part of your body start to, to ache or hurt. Um, so I would definitely say, obviously a lot of the weightlifting movements are going to be down in your legs. You know, I remember seeing pictures of you 
out on the stage and your your legs are just massive, you know, with all the, the lifting that you guys have to do. So definitely rolling out and stretching the lower body is a, a big component to to start with for sure. Now, when you talk about stretching and, and specifically what you do in gymnastics and what you do for weightlifting as well, what, what are some of those go-to stretches that you use? Are they, um, I know you guys do more uh, like long static stretching in gymnastics. Do you, are you still using those or are there other forms of stretching that you're using to, to warm up to get into these positions? Yeah, still doing the, the long static to kind of uh, just improve my flexibility. But yeah, for things, I, I'm not sure if everybody knows what a butterfly stretch is. You know, you're kind of just sitting there with your feet clamped together and you're kind of stretching and leaning over. Um, that's always a, a nice, easy one to kind of start with. And then all, obviously sitting in a straddle, getting my legs a little past 90 degrees and, and leaning to each side because that's a that one's great for hamstrings and uh, also getting some glutes and lower back, trying to reach down and lay down on each side of your leg and then lay down, getting your chest down to the ground um, while your legs are straddled. You know, pike stretch, putting your legs together, trying to get your chest down to your knees, keeping those legs straight um, and even bending one leg in and kind of uh, putting one leg back, almost like a lunge with your with your leg on the floor is another good glute and lower back stretch for me that I do every single day. Um, you know, and I think everybody's a little bit different. If you're, if you specifically get tight in one area, that's something you maybe need to focus on more than other people. And for me, that's kind of my glutes and lower back. So, so Jake, if we move on a little bit from this stretching component and start talking a little bit about what you're doing now on the coaching side, you know, I've, I've known you for years. Um, you know, even when you were J.O. gymnast and I was training over at Stanford and, we were all hoping that you would be part of the Stanford team. Uh, and unfortunately you decided to go to the dark side and go to OU instead. Um, you know, you, yeah, you've always now. had, <laughs> you've always had great coaching. And after going to university of Oklahoma, you know, you were coached by uh, Mark Williams for the most part. Uh, and you had some great assistants there as well. And so you've, you've had some coaches who are considered some of the best uh, that we have within this country. Uh, first, I'm curious about like, what you've taken from them uh, as an athlete and have now moved into a little bit more into the coaching world, uh, anything that you learned from them that you really kind of look back at and say, geez, I'm so glad I had this available to me. Uh, I learned this from them and now I'm so glad I'm able to kind of like bring this to the next generation of athletes that I'm working with. Yeah, definitely. I would say one of the, the key components that I remember learning and really appreciating is uh, working with everybody different, you know, differently. Uh, not everybody wants to be coached the same and not everybody reacts the same way as an athlete f with their coach. Uh, you know, I think if you kind of look back to that, the, the typical old school hardcore coach that just wants to scream or yell at everybody, I realized when I was younger that I needed that at certain times, but if I was like that, if I had that every single day, I just was kind of like burnt out. I just didn't want to do it. I wanted some I wanted a, a little bit more of positivity and, uh, you know, that positive reinforcement to, you know, just give you that push. Because if you if you really want to get better at something, you're going to push yourself and you're going to work really hard. And at some point, you're going to need someone to kind of help lift you up through it. You know, if you're slacking off and getting lazy, you would get yelled at. But that was something I learned from uh, a couple of coaches of mine that they learned how to work with specific athletes different, you know, because like I said, everybody's a little bit different and they react in a different way. And I try to take that to my coaching style now. If I see somebody that seems like they need to get pushed a little bit harder than others, that then I can kind of do that and find their, their the not necessarily breaking point, but the point that they, you know, maybe you're pushing them too hard or you're not pushing them enough and like I said, everybody's different, and I try and carry that into my coaching now, too. Yeah, I love that. I love that mentality, and it's something that I actually learned uh, later in my career as well. You know, after having certain coaches that, you know, coach more in the negative way, negative reinforcement, and then moving on to some other coaches that coach more in a positive way, you know, if you're only coached by a coach that has negative reinforcement or punishes if something doesn't go according to plan, you think that that's the way that coaching is supposed to be done, right? You think that that's the right. only route to success, that you need to do these things, and if not, there's a negative consequence. And I think, especially if you're exposed to it at a younger age, if you can start kind of getting around coaches that have that positivity and have that ability to get the most out of you and 
make every day in the gym exciting and enjoyable and something that you're, you know, you want to go and do, I think it completely changes the mentality that you have as being an athlete. I think it'll probably have less likelihood of burnout, less likelihood of wanting to move on to other sports. And I, I completely agree. And, and um, I'm glad that you mentioned that because for me, it was something that I found later in my career with some of my later coaches that a positive coach that reinforces positivity has such a huge impact in my ability to get the most out of myself, but then also my willingness and my wantingness to go into the gym saying, oh man, like, you know, if you had a negative coach, I got to go in this, who knows what's going to happen today? He's going to yell at me. Is he going to, you know, is he going to make my day worse or is he going to make my day better? Right. And I think that's what a positive coach does. He makes your day better and gets the most out of you that way. And, and being able to do that on an individual basis is really challenging to do. Do you find it that you're able to do it fairly easily? Because the coaches that were good at it that I worked with, it was like a, a skill, man. It was something that I looked at as you know having a superpower, that they could kind of read my mind, right? Mm. That they were able to get the most out of me without me saying anything. And I always looked at my coach and be like, there's no way I can do that. Like, I can't be a coach on that level. I just don't have that in me. Do you find that you actually had that ability or is it something you're kind of learning? I think it's something, you know, like you said, I agree. Some people I think have it right away. Um, I, I, I don't know. I would like to kind of ask the athletes and see what they think. But um, I think it's definitely something I just try to continue to work at. Um, coaching, like anything, you're not perfect. But, you know, I think you can kind of find your way there by – you know, like I said, when you're pushing somebody and they kind of, you can kind of find their breaking point of where you see them instead of them getting motivated, they kind of either shut down or they, they just want to, you know, not be there. You can kind of see that or feel it. And, uh, you know, I've done that with a few athletes and it's like, you kind of feel bad. You don't want to push them and make them not enjoy it. But now it's like, okay, now I know your breaking point. I know how hard to push you, you know, and we'll get close to that, but I'm not going to do it to the point where it, you, you break that anymore. And, and sometimes, you know, I feel like, like you said, I've had coaches who are awesome, and at some points you um, you disagree with them, but they find a way to get it out of you and, and keep you going. And I just I think I'm continuing to learn. I, I just I, yeah I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. It's hard to think. And about. how old are the kids? How old the kids that you're perfect, working with? But, um, so I work with everybody right now. I'm not in charge of one specific group, um, but the kids are they range from six seven years old up to like 15, 16 years old. Um, Do you find a specific age group more enjoyable, less enjoyable, or is it kind of like just dependent on the student? I think it depends on the student. It's obviously a lot of fun when you have a kid who wants to work hard and wants to learn. Uh, the, The challenging ones are the ones that maybe are lazy or don't care as much, you know, but it's also kind of fun to work with them too and and maybe change their mindset to make them want to work harder or, you know, enlighten them a little bit. And and when you see those guys get excited and start working hard and challenge themselves, that's, that's a really cool feeling. Absolutely. Do you envision any higher hopes for the coaching side of things, collegiate, anything having to do with Team USA? Do you envision that one day or you enjoy doing the, um, the, the younger guys? No, I think I, I enjoy the younger guys. I think if, you know, like uh, if I didn't have a family gym to come back to and help run and, and help coach here with the with the younger athletes, I definitely think college coaching would be really fun and really enjoyable. Um, but, you know, with with the club program we have here and just the system set up, I, I really enjoy it out here. And I just I don't think I'll end up leaving. So sweet. Yeah, Jake, do you you know, you're talking about coaching gymnastics. Do you do any other coaching? Do you coach in the CrossFit world at all or? Uh, any weightlifting uh, as well? I've done a little bit of, you know, just fitness coaching and I've helped friends at the gym locally, actually, which is kind of fun. Uh, you know, I'll get up, they know me as obviously the gymnast, so I'll get a lot of questions from that. Um, and obviously one of the really, really fun things I get to do is come out to Power Monkey with you guys uh, every couple of times and, and, and really enjoy that. So I'm new to the Olympic lifting, um, the weightlifting category of that and really enjoy that. But uh, specifically, mostly just the gymnastics part and helping with the fitness stuff on the, on the side. Cool. You, do you envision kind of uh, expanding the family uh, gym into anything fitness related? Or are you guys just looking to, to key in specifically on the gymnastics demographic? And is it heavily, you know, weighted onto the women's side? Or do you guys have a pretty good balance between men's and women's gymnastics? Yeah, the, the fitness side, I think there is a pretty cool avenue to go to with kind of an adult gymnastics class there's uh we don't have any of those specifically right now and 
once my traveling kind of dies down a little bit, I might look into something like that. But right now our insurance for our facility doesn't go above, I think 22 years old. Hmm. So, um, but I, that, I, I've noticed over the last few years with CrossFit that a lot more adults and um, the older generations are getting into the gymnastics movements and they're like, you should teach a gymnastics class at your gym. And, and uh, you know, which would be really awesome. I think that that's an avenue I'd really love to do. But right now, just being so busy, it's hard to be able to to be there strictly for that class every like two to three times a week, every single week. Um, but yeah. And then uh, what was it? Oh, the the expanding. Yeah. Men's expanding and women's. What, what was the other men's part? and women's? Oh, yeah. Is it, uh... women's. Yeah. Um, I think typically gymnastics is obviously known to have more women in their sport. We there, I've been to a few gyms where the men's side's a little bit better. We're, we're pretty equal The our women's team is definitely a little bit bigger, um, which I think is just natural just because there's usually more girls in the sport, but our boys team is, is growing and, uh, it's, it's really cool to see. We held the gymnastics meet this last weekend and I had about 80, 80 to a hundred more boys in the competition this year than last year. So it was really cool to see the men's side kind of grow from last year to this year. Awesome. That's what I want to hear. I love hearing that. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and you mentioned, uh, staying busy, Jake. I know one of those things that's keeping you a little bit busy right now is trying to break into the YouTube world a little, a little bit more, which is definitely an interesting venture and a tough venture in itself. Um, is that in collaboration with, with your gym, with, with, uh, what you're doing with coaching or something outside of that? That's pretty much um, outside of that right now. You know, I did a, a YouTube series training up for Rio for the Olympics, and uh, that was kind of my audience when I started my YouTube channel. And they kind of gave them a background or a behind the scenes look on just the everyday training, the meals, the the nutrition that I was getting, and then you know, obviously going into the gyms, seeing the routines and the skills. So that was a, a really fun avenue for me. I enjoy creating the videos. It kind of gave me a an outlet outside of the gym gave me something else to do, kind of take your mind off of training and the stress mm -hmm. of getting ready for the Olympics and everything like that. Um, and now I'm just kind of trying to find my audience again. You know, now I'm, I'm back home. I'm able to do some more fun things that I wasn't able to do when I was training, you know, getting into the outdoors, going hiking and, and camping with some family, uh, recently getting into fishing. So I'm kind of re just evolving my YouTube channel to, um, you know, just, uh, after the, after the sports and, uh, what, what I'm into now. So it's been really fun. Yeah, that, that's really cool. And, and we've been told that your most popular video so far involves a dog in the background. What's the story with that? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, uh, so it was pretty funny. I was just doing a, a, a video back in Oklahoma and it was still kind of during the training days. And I was talking to the camera in the mirror and I actually had no idea, but somebody screenshotted it and sent it to <laughs> me. And my dog ended up scooting across the floor, you know, when they're trying to itch their, their butt, basically. <laughs> and it, she just scoots with her feet in a straddle across <laughs> nice. the mirror in the background. And I, I had no idea. I edited the whole video. I watched the video, no idea. And uh, once I put it out there, you're going to have those people that see something like yeah. that. And it was, it was pretty funny. <laughs> hey, the dog was just trying to perform a little gymnastics in the background. That's all. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, dude. Some stalder walks, you know, yeah. something that so I was terrible at. She's really good at. <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that's really cool. Well, where, where can people uh, find your YouTube channel? What is your YouTube channel called? Yeah, just search Jake Dalton on YouTube. My channel, that's just, it's just Jake Dalton. So uh, you can also just do youtube.com slash Jake Dalton and it'll take you there. Very cool. Very cool. So, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about your coaching and, and a little bit about your, how you got started in gymnastics and everything else. I want to kind of go back in time a little bit uh, about 10 years before you went to the Olympics in 2012 and 2016 and talk about the 2009 world championships. You mentioned to us before the recording that that was an experience that kind of transformed you. Uh, what was the story there? Yeah. So basically I was a senior in high school, 17 was committed to Oklahoma and um, it was kind of a hard time because I go to U.S. Championships, which are in August. And straight from U.S. Championships, I was moving to Oklahoma right after that. And uh, I had made the world team. And it was so it was kind of a weird transition time of going from club to college while making my first world championship team. And that was kind of my first it was going to be my first international event. So I ended up having to go to Japan um, uh, about two weeks before going to the London world championship. So I could get some international experience. Um, 
But once I got to London, you know, I was basically specifically chose for that team. It was an individual world championships, meaning you're not going to compete as a team and you just go out on your individual events. And I was just strictly there for vault. And, um, you know, 17 years old, I was doing a, one of the, probably the hardest vaults at that time, uh, in, in our country at least. And so that was why I went there. And then I get there, you know, it's exciting. I got a little bit sick. Um, I ended up having, I believe, so I got strep, uh, about like four or five times my freshman year. And I think that was the first time I got there. So I was super sick before, um, the Japan. And then I got sick when I was in London and ended up doing, a two and a half on vault instead of a triple full and sitting down and uh, just completely kind of blew it. And I was, so I was literally there for almost two weeks. I competed for about 30 seconds and that was it. And it was kind of uh, just an eye opening experience that, uh, that it's not easy. And cause everything before that had been going really well. And it was just, a, it was an eye opening experience getting out there and I was kind of embarrassed, but I think that was a good turning point for me to get back into the gym and, uh, you know, and, and get back to work. It was, it was just a really good, but hard experience. I think I want to give a, some perspective on, on what you just mentioned there first, just for listeners who aren't really fully aware of, uh, kind of gymnastics format and competitions, uh, 2009 world championships was the year after the 2008 Olympic games in Beijing. The year after every Olympic games is an individual, uh, world championships, individual meaning like Jake said, there's no team aspect to it. So we end up forming our team based around who we think as an individual can actually medal on specific events or in the all around. There's an all around competition, there's individual events. So Jake being 17 years old, this is really worth noting because it's extremely rare to have somebody under the age of 18 compete at the senior level at a world championship or Olympic games. It's only happened a handful of times in Team USA history. So Jake is kind of one of these guys that's an anomaly. You know, at 17 years old for him to be at a skill level, especially having no international experience at all, to be thrown at the Wolves at a World Championships at 17 years old is incredible. I mean, the the amount of pressure that you have in that situation just can't be understated. He, Him out on that competition floor at 17 years old at his first World Championships is a really, really important note there. It's a really important, it's a big deal. Now, Jake, a couple things. One, you said you did two and a half instead of the triple full. Uh, or cause double full or cause one and a half, whatever you want to, however you want to look at it. Um, right. Did you do the two and a half because you were feeling a little run down from, uh, from the illness or did it just happen? You made the decision split second while you were in the air or that was kind of what was intended. Did you kind of make the decision um, out on the floor? No, it was, it was one of those split second decisions um, going, you know, I was running down the vault runway felt a little close to the vault table. And as soon as I blocked off, you know, it didn't, it didn't send me straight up into the air. Like I'm supposed to for a triple full kind of threw me a little bit forward. And I just kind of knew from there, I wasn't going to make the, uh, the last twist around and ended up doing the two and a half and sitting down. So it was one of those kind of in the air decisions that you have to make in a split second and sat down. And that's where the, mm-hmm. you know, the disappointment was right there. I was just so, so bummed after for that. For sure. And, and for all the listeners out there, Jake is one of the best vaulters and tumblers that we've ever had come out of this country. Uh, a couple of things I really, I always want to make sure people understand kind of some of the nuance about gymnastics when we talk about these big skills and stuff. So on vault, you're running down, you run down basically as fast as you possibly can. You jump, you hit the board it launches you onto a table. From there, you end up doing a bunch of flips and twists and land on your feet. Now, in international competition, as a vaulter, you have to perform two vaults. And they take both scores and they average them. And that's who the winner of the vault competition is. Now, Jake, your first vault was this triple full. And there's been, you know, maybe five guys in the U.S. that have done good triple fulls over the years. Uh, yours... It was phenomenal. Especially 17 years old, it was one of these things that, you know, we looked at it like, wow, like this guy's going to have an amazing career. Um, what was your second vault and what happened on that? Because that was your first vault. You sat it down and you're like, oh man, all right, clearly this 30 seconds didn't go as I anticipated. What was your mindset walking back to the end of the runway? What was your second vault? And did you basically already have in your mind like, okay, this is over. I can kind of just, you know, put this one down too. It doesn't really matter. Or did you try to step up and say, I'm going to try to end on as positive of a note as possible? Yeah, I think almost a, a mix of that. I knew, you know, I knew I wasn't going to make a vault final 
falling on that, especially, you know, if it, it might've been different if I did the triple full and maybe fell on that where you're starting at a higher start value. Um, but I kind of knew I was already out at that point, but I did want to not embarrass myself again and go out there and actually land the next vault. So kind of, uh, you know, for those who don't know gymnastics, the second vault, you basically walk down the vault runway until the judge is done judging and you have to do the next vault. So the next vault's usually a little bit easier. Um, and I went out and did a front handspring. I believe I only did a front handspring one and a half. So it was a Rudy. Um, I usually ended up after that would do a double full or a two and a half. But at that point in my career, uh, wasn't working the second vault as much as, as normal because you're just so used to working six events and not specifically that one event for the one world championship. So I went out and did the front handspring one and a half, I believe. And I, I believe I landed that it was okay. Um, but you know, after that I was just like, all right, well, at least I, I'm on with that one and I don't, I don't have to worry about it. You know, I, I made one, got done and was just kind of just bummed about that first one. Any coach or any individual or any teammate or anything like that, that kind of helped you become that guy on the floor that anyone could count on. Um, I know collegiate experience is one of the things that anyone who goes through a collegiate gymnastics program will tell you that it's one of the most important parts of their, their athletic careers. And I'm sure you would say the same thing, but do you have anybody of note, whether it be a coach, uh, another teammate or anything like that, that really kind of helped shape you into the athlete that you were? Yeah, I would, uh, I, you know, obviously you can't, can't not recognize the coach, right? Mark has, uh, been a, a vital role in my gymnastics career and, you know, even the coaches before him, but, um, you know, that he really kind of showed me how to prepare for a meet and how to be ready for the meet at a specific time and really peak at a specific, uh, competition. So I, I realized I could always trust his training and his program and his schedule. And we, we had a great relationship working together. Um, you know, definitely a little bit of a rough start trying to figure each other out. But after that, it was, it was an awesome relationship that, you know, I'll cherish forever. Um, a, a big key role was also my teammate, Steve Legendre. He was an alternate to the 2012, uh, Olympic team on multiple world championship teams with me and silver medalist on vault. Um, he was two years older than I was and he went to Oklahoma. So when I got there, he kind of took me under his wing. We were always, uh, you know, strength partners. Basically what that is, is in the morning we would have about an hour of strength. So Mark always paired me up with him and it was, uh, you know, just his, his work ethic, his, uh, you know, just his ability to kind of push you at the same time he's pushing himself and really to be selfless and coach you at the same time. You know, like I said, he was two years older than me. He was way more powerful than I was on floor. And he was good at understanding a lot of the technique as well. So he was selfless in the fact that he was helping coach me at the same time. We would help each other. And if I could, was struggling with something, he would correct me. And then we would go to a competition and compete against each other. You know, and I think that says a lot about Steve's character and, and what the, what kind of person he is, because, you know, we ended up competing kind of for the same spots on those Olympic teams and, you know, a bittersweet moment of me making that Olympic team. He didn't make it onto the Olympic team. He was the, the alternate, which is awesome, but that was not his goal, you know, but for him to be in the gym every day, still helping me after that, um, you know, it's just, that says a lot about him. So he was a, a vital role in my, in my career for sure. I always found that relationship to be, and you know, Steve has been to camp with us a bunch of times too. We love Legendre and we, we think the world of both of you guys. And I always found that relationship between the two of you guys really interesting, having, you know, been the athlete rep with you guys for a number of years and seeing the way you guys train. It was super interesting that you guys were strong and weak on the same events. You guys had the yeah. same <laughs> strengths and weaknesses as an athlete, right? You were both great on floor and vault. You know, you had... And essentially, this be, this became an issue, right? That you guys, like you said, were vying for the exact same spots. You, and right. consider this, guys. This is your training with what in many cases could be your best friend. And you're vying for the same Olympic spot because you're both great on the same apparatus and weak in the same area. So the way the teams are formatted, it's a puzzle, right? You need to figure out how these teams all fit together to create the best optimum five guys. So if you guys are both training together, you guys are trying to maximize the potential for both, but at the same time, know that it's challenging for both of you guys to be on the same Olympic team because you guys are so good at the same, same events and weak at the same events. How was that you guys, how was that for you guys kind of being in the gym every day, kind of knowing that? 
I think, you know, I think we definitely both kind of knew that we obviously had a hope that we could make it onto the same team being strong on those events and being strong enough on those events that it was a possibility. And, you know, we really hoped that, but, um, you would think there would be some type of, uh, you know, evil feeling, or you would feel that jealous or this or that, but it was honestly, it was the best, the best relationship, the best training that we could have ever had. I think, uh, we didn't really think about it too much. And if it was going to be him or if it was going to be me, we were both going to be super stoked about whoever made it or if we could both make it. Um, you know, he was sitting next to me when I, when I was named to the first Olympic team and, the first thing he did was just grab me and hugged me and he was stoked for me, you know? And that, like I said, that just speaks to his character, but the, the relationship in, in the gym was, it was one of the things I loved the most going into the gym and you're challenging yourself with your best friends every single day was, you know, incredible. Yeah. You guys are two of the biggest class acts that we've had in, in uh, USA gymnastics. And, uh, I, I, I love watching you guys compete and I love hearing these stories about you guys training together and, you know, that's the nature of the sport, you know, um, it's not always, you know, perfect in the way that you write it up. Uh, but I love hearing that you guys were able to kind of go through that together and see how it all worked out. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, I definitely just want to say it, it, it's great that you had, uh, those few key characters in your, in your life that really helped you get to where you were going. And it's always Awesome to hear a story about um, a failure um, that really led you to somewhere great. We all have, you know, weaknesses or failures in our life that can um, can maybe pull us down for a little bit, but you know that we can use to go to a better place. Um, I had, you know, at the Olympics in 2008, it was it was a devastating performance for for me, and for years after that, I would just be in the car driving or something, and for seemingly seemingly no reason I would start crying you know just because it was uh, that that moment that feeling came back to me um, but then after that was over it was motivating for me you know so these things that happen in our life um, can, can change us in that way and it's really cool to hear this story about how that experience in 2009 from a very young age before you know when you were just getting started in your career really it seems like it bled through your whole career it's almost like um, you know, Dave said you became that clutch guy. It's almost like, uh, tell me if I'm, I'm wrong here, that it was always on your mind. It was always something in the back of your mind that, that said, you know what, um, I learned from that, that mo that's going to motivate me to, to be better and to do better in this specific situation. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely correct, you know, and, and I, I, I tried to explain it. And I think when I look back on it now, it makes so much sense, but I don't think I really realized it at the time that that was kind of the, the motivating factor or that one, that one specific moment that kind of drove me to, to not want it to happen again. And I would talk to teammates and cause you would kind of get that question is of, you know, why do this, why do that and how not to fall or under pressure. And I was like, I just really hate falling and disappointing the team. And my buddy was like, well, we all do, you know, I'm like, I, I, I know, I just, I can't explain it, but I, I do think that, the you know, 2009 was kind of a, a key role in, into just that feeling and taking it back into the gym every day for motivation. Like you said. Yeah. Well, I think some of it too, is that when you, when you fail in that way, or, or when you have these types of failures, you know, they can either, cause you to do it again because you're so scared of doing it again or you figure out a way for that not to happen and and what I think happens too is that you know it allows us or it teaches us to accept the possibility of failure and I think when we accept the possibility of failure then we free up our mind a little bit to go out there and focus in and perform in, in the way that we need to and it sounds like that's what happened uh, there for you. But as much as I li would like to continue talking about gymnastics, Jake, you know that I'm a weightlifter. So <laughs> I do want to talk about weightlifting right a little yeah. bit. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah. Yeah. Weightlifting is great. Yeah. We're done. No. Um, so you were actually recruited uh, by USA Weightlifting maybe a couple years ago now uh, to try out weightlifting a little bit. Can you tell us how that came about and, and what that experience was like for you? Yeah, it was uh, really cool. You know, and once you're done with gymnastics, you're kind of looking for something else, right? Something else to occupy your time and challenge you. And um, I was reached out by um, USA Weightlifting. So they just sent sent out an email. They said they they worked with other athletes once they're kind of retired in their sport. And they like working with athletes that have a lot of body control and strength and 
Um, they just asked if I was interested in learning. And I was like, you know what? Why not? Because they were they were willing to help me get set up with a weightlifting gym where I was located, looking for a coach and things like that. And um, I love to challenge myself, so I figured, why not? Let's let's take a shot at it. If anything, it's some some education, some workouts, and so I got set up with a local gym here and just started going a couple days a week. And uh, my wife, who is a retired gymnast from college gymnastics as well, ended up coming with me one day and started doing it as well. So it was a really cool kind of fun thing we got to do together and we ended up competing a couple of times and yeah, it's been a really cool avenue to see how gymnastics has transitioned to helping me into other things, especially things like weightlifting. And, um, it's been really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't realize that you had uh, competed a couple of times. Can you compare the, uh, I don't know anything about a weightlifting competition and being out on the weightlifting platform you know that you're there by yourself just like you're there by yourself on a gymnastics routine um are, are they comparable or are they were they the same for you uh was it more difficult for you to focus out on the weightlifting platform because it was maybe unfamiliar what was that like yeah it's like you said there's some things that are are similar you know the nerves and the going out there and kind of making these small mistakes because you're nervous um are all kind of the same it's definitely different in terms of uh you know, I'm going out there and I'm kind of focusing on, on just those, those two lifts, right? You, you lift three times of each lift. And so that was kind of something to get used to was warming up in the back gym and how much weight do you go and you know, how you're warming up and having a new plan. I had to kind of create a new plan and try and get consistent with that. So I could go out and, and complete all of my lifts. But, um, it, and it's also different when you're out on the platform, you've got people or judges right in your face. So you're kind of that, that soul center person out there lifting, you know, in gymnastics, there's usually a lot of events, a lot of people, a lot of things going on. But when you're weightlifting, I think that was a little bit more added pressure when it's just specifically you and everybody's sitting there watching you. Um, but it, it still has that same, you get nervous, you, you know, like I said, you make a few of those mistakes and you have to learn how to work with those mistakes and, and lifting when you're nervous. Yeah, are there any similarities? Um, I wonder to the warm up process you mentioned having to kind of learn a little bit more about that with weightlifting. And so to explain that a little bit, we we get three attempts in the snatch and then three in the clean and jerk. And so before you go out for your opening attempt in the snatch, you're in the back room and and you know you want to warm up to that. You're not just going to go out on the competition platform and and try to lift a heavy weight cold. You're gonna you know start with the bar and then start increasing weight and do a certain number of reps and set building up to that. And a lot of athletes will even take the same weight in the back room as they're going to open with out on the competition platform if they're a little bit inexperienced and, and don't quite have that confidence to, to make a jump yet. Um, so are there any similarities in gymnastics? Do you guys kind of do the same thing where you, uh, you slowly warm up and then ramp up to uh, the most difficult variation of, of the skill that you're about to perform. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, that's what I was trying to figure out, you know, in gymnastics, we do the same exact thing. Every event you're going up, you warm up a little bit, you know, like you said, you're not doing the full routine that you would be doing, um, when you're competing, but I would go up there and warm up the certain skills, especially the ones you're either nervous about, or you maybe are a little more difficult and you, and you need to do it and practice it before you go out there and compete it. So that's what I was trying to get used to was going in the back, finding what weights I wanted to lift to and kind of getting in that rhythm of, uh, I, I know what weight to, to lift on each turn, how many turns I should take. Just like in gymnastics, you don't want to go out there and do too much and get tired and then go and try your routine and, and fail or kind of get gassed out. Um, and that was a really same, the, the same kind of component weightlifting. Uh, you know, I was definitely not as experienced with the weightlifting, but that's what I was able to correlate was how much do I warm up? How much is too much? How much is not enough? Um, and I think that can be said definitely about both sports. That's cool. Uh, now as you were training, uh, the time that you spend in the gym, specifically learning weightlifting and, uh, and trying it out, what did you find that you were that you struggled with the most and what came the most natural to you? Um, you know, it was kind of the opposite. I thought clean and jerk was going to be something that I was going to be pretty good at and snatch I thought was going to be a little confusing. Um, but I actually ended up picking up snatching fairly quick. Um, and clean and jerk for me was probably the hardest part 
uh, was just my mobility in the front rack. I think it probably took me yeah. two to three weeks to actually be able to get the bar to touch, you know, my shoulders. Uh, I don't have very flexible wrists and my lats. And I think it's known as gymnasts, um, your lats and your traps and everything are very tight. So to, to get my wrists in a good angle and my lats to open up and get that front rack position, um, it, it took me a while. And that was one of the most challenging parts of, of lifting. Yeah, that's very interesting. We talk a lot, obviously, about gymnastics and weightlifting on the podcast, and, and in general, we, we do anyway, but um, I was mentioning on the last recording that gymnasts are known as the most flexible and mobile athletes in the Olympics, and weightlifters are second to uh, to the gymnast, um, and I was asking Dave Tilly if he felt that there were any areas that weightlifters were commonly a little more flexible in, um, if any at all. And I think he admitted one or two, uh, Dave, I can't remember. Yeah, specifically, he was saying hips, but I think hips he did and then mention, overhead position. Yeah. Yeah. Typically mm -hmm. that, that overhead position, but the, the <clears throat> fact that you struggled in the front rack, do you, you said com commonly gymnasts are tied in a few areas. Can you, uh, can you go over those again? And do you think that because you're a gymnast or gymnast in general, male gymnasts in general, would struggle in the same areas under a bar or was that more common just or uh, specific to you? Um, I think overall, you know, gymnasts, I think are tight in your lats. I think a lot from rings, but um, you know, I, that was one of those guys who was pretty strong on rings. So it was kind of one of my events. Um, if, if that's not typically your strength for gymnastics, I don't think you would maybe have as much of a problem. Um, just because, you know, I feel like rings is one of those events that tightens up your lats and, uh, obviously you're swinging. So it's still, um, you still have to be flexible, but m the issue with me that was a little, maybe more specific was my wrist flexibility. Um, I was terrible on pommel horse and that was prob probably a lot of the reason why was my wrist flexibility was pretty terrible. Um, so I think that was a, a combination of the reasons, you know, I was tight in my lats from doing so much strength on rings and my, you know, my shoulders weren't super flexible. And then also having my wrist flexibility pretty, pretty bad as well was just kind of a, a pretty big detriment to trying to get that front rack. Sure. So do you, uh, do you struggle in a handstand uh, a little bit because of that? Or is that pretty good? I do it, you know, handstands definitely hurt the wrists. So I have to warm up, um, pretty good to get them feeling good. Once, once I'm kind of warm, it's okay. But you know, my, like I said, my teammate, Steve Lejandra would wake up and do a handstand just cause he loved handstands and he could do them all the right. time. Um, for me, that sounded miserable just because it took me a little <laughs> bit for my wrist to be able to open up to the position and, and actually be able to do it. And that was something I learned at your guys's camp was I was able to work on some of the the flexibility and the strengths and the, the mobility of my wrist and ended up enjoying handstands mm -hmm. more because of that. Oh, so you, so Dave taught you a little something, uh, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. I paid yeah, you to say that, he, you know, he's not uh, just a pretty guy. Yeah. He's smart uh, too, you know? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, he, he is a pretty guy, but Dave, you, you know, I've seen you do a lot of weightlifting through the years. Now you have a, a great front rack position, um, and a great, easy, comfortable overhead position. What is the, can you compare a little bit of the, the difference between the two of you there and why oh, well, that might be? My wrists are very flexible, um, almost to the point where it's a little bit detrimental, maybe some loose, loose, uh, connected tissue in there. Uh, but it allows me to really get into, uh, proper alignment with my handstands to make sure my fingertips are in the right direction. And it has helped a lot with some of the positional components that go into weightlifting as well. My front rack has always been fairly solid. I would say that, the wrist isn't really a big limiting factor for me or my lats. Uh, my lats and overhead position has also mm -hmm. uh, been something that has always been very um, strong for me in terms of my ability to get through some full ranges. Um, but I do notice a little bit of pain in my elbow when I'm in front rack position. And I think I've had mm -hmm. so many elbow issues over the years that, uh, that that's probably the thing that needs to get warmed up the most. Uh, I notice that when I get compressed, especially when I have heavy weight on the bar, heavy relative, heavy weight, um, some <laughs> weight on the bar and in that front rock position. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, keep my yeah, mouth shut I, on that. I Dave. misspoke. <laughs> Definitely not heavyweight. Uh, very, very lightweight on the bar. Uh, that front rack position doesn't bother my wrist. It doesn't bother my shoulders. It doesn't bother my lats. I notice it primarily in my elbows. Yeah. The, the front rack is definitely very elbow intensive. I think a lot of people 
don't even think about that. And especially if it's not an issue for you, but for e even the slight amount of tension there, you're going to feel it uh, tugging on you pretty hard. I have people do front squats with straps a lot just for, for overall uh, mobility work there. And, and usually that's where they'll feel it. It's really tugging on the elbow a lot with, with your arm being completely bent and um, shoulder externally rotated, trying to get those hands out to a, to a certain width. But with all this weightlifting talk that we've we've done, Jake, and, and again, Dave, it's kind of an unfair question for us to ask, but something that we're asking uh, all of our guests that we have on, and we're kind of keeping a running tally, and Dave is certainly by and far uh, ahead of me on this. We ask, what is the better sport um, or discipline between gymnastics and weightlifting? Don't let me what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you, you broke up, so can you say that that question again real quick? Yeah, for sure. It's just a question that we're keeping a running tally on um, for all the guests that we, we that we have on. And, you know, fortunately for Dave, it's been mostly a uh, gymnast, so he's winning right now. But what is the better sport or discipline, gymna gymnastics or weightlifting? Oh, man, I'm going <laughs> to have to go with gymnastics. Yeah, all right. Wow, I was <laughs> never going to speak to you again, Jake, if you went in the, the wrong uh, direction there. <laughs> Yeah, de definitely understandable that you would say yeah. gymnastics. I already chalked that one up as a loss. And now, you know, Serbus, I'm worried yeah. that he, he he's a weightlifter, but I'm worried that he's going to say gymnastics as well. So I kind of don't want to have uh, him on here. But, you know, coming into <laughs> the CrossFit community and actually being on a podcast where you have uh, a weightlifting specialist and a gymnastics specialist and, uh, you know, with Power Monkey and with, with CrossFit really – bringing not only these two worlds together, but a lot of other sports and disciplines as well. Um, what what are your last kind of quick thoughts on weightlifting? Do you think that uh, gymnasts will, would benefit from doing a little bit of weightlifting? Do you think weightlifters would benefit from doing a little bit of gymnastics? Yeah, I think definitely on both sides of that. You know, I, I've talked to, you know, Dave and Mike from Power Monkey a couple of times and even you a little bit about it. Um, I think gymnasts really have, uh, lacked on some of the weightlifting components. And I think it's, you know, cause most of us think if we do weightlifting, you're going to get bulky or you're going to, you know, lose the fast twitch muscles by doing squats and, and kind of some of those movements. And I think we really could have benefited from that. I know Dave's got a, a couple surgeries down on his knees. I've had two surgeries on my uh, left knee. Um, and I think that's a pretty big issue in the gymnastics community of not stabilizing some of those, you know, muscles around our, you know, our knees or our hips. And we could really benefit from, from doing things like squats and getting into the kind of the hip mobility where I think a lot of gymnasts lack as well. And we could use that for a lot of skills in terms of like straddle press handstands, um, stalders on high bar. Um, you know, there's a lot of movements that being stronger in your knees and more mobile and flexible in your hips would really benefit and kind of vice versa. I think for the weightlifters, I think gymnastics creates, you know, overall athleticism in terms of just body control, understanding how to move your body to one side and, and, you know, and really work with it. So I think that would be beneficial for, for weightlifters as well. Um, so I think it, they both kind of correlate and could help each other out. Uh, tremendously. And I think that's why you see weightlifters and gymnasts do really well in CrossFit because those two together go hand in hand for, for mm -hmm. CrossFit. Definitely. I think you just made Chad's day. Yeah. Uh, Jake saying that <laughs> gymnasts should do more squatting. You just definitely are like, okay, I got what I came yeah. here for. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, 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 he knows me well. He knows the exact <laughs> word that I want to hear. He could have said, actually, I heard nothing that you said, Jake. You said squat. Yeah, that, exactly. That's all that registered in my mind there. <laughs> but, yep. you know, yeah. I, def I definitely agree. You know, weightlifters could, could definitely use a little bit more gymnastics in their life. There, there's no doubt about it. And, in fact, with all the, the, the programs that I send out to people, there's usually not a day goes by that there's not – some sort of gymnastics move moving in there. They see a lot of videos of Dave doing uh, some uh, some sh some shoulder remedials and, and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. now that you 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 know both of you guys have have uh, uh, knee surgeries, previous knee surgeries. Jake, do you think from the squatting that you've done over the last couple of years, would it be fair to say that you're potentially that your legs are stronger than they've ever been? That you're maybe more that you're healthier and um, could potentially could have potentially had a uh, better longevity if you would have been squatting before. Yeah. You know, 
I definitely uh, would have to agree. I think right now with the the leg kind of routine and the, and just including squats and doing so much more um, leg workouts, you know, in terms of just even mobilizing, you know, doing quad extension, hamstring curls. I think gymnasts are known to have kind of weak hamstrings, and I think that was something that caused me to have surgery was my quad was very strong and my hamstrings were pretty weak. And that's, you know, when I went to land, it pulled my patella off the bone. And I think, uh, doing what I'm doing now, they definitely feel stronger. You know, um, my joints and kind of my ankles and things that I would tumble with still kind of hurt, but in terms of overall stability with my legs, they definitely feel, feel really good right now. And I think it would have benefited, you know, tremendously in, in my gymnastics career, and uh, I think that would be just one thing that I regret is just not knowing enough about it. For sure. And and once again, that's great to hear. Thank you for those kind <laughs> words uh, about weightlifting. And, and uh, we're now reached the point of the uh, the recording where we're gonna we're gonna play a game if you're up for for a game. And uh, you can pick between two that we have to offer. One is the random question game, and the other one is would you rather. Ooh. Let's do would you rather. Can't go wrong there. That's always fun. <laughs> All right, very good. So I'm going to get my uh, my daughter's would you rather cards here that I have available. Let me just shuffle those real quick. <laughs> nice. Just so we're sure that I'm not, I'm not cheating or anything like that. <laughs> All right, so the first one is would you rather suck on a drool, uh, drool sickle? So... Yeah, that's that's interesting. Or have the phys- have the physique of a baby but enlarged. So I don't know. I don't know if you guys can can see this or not. All right, it's an interesting oh, uh, interesting choices there. <laughs> I'll go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's go with the the baby physique enlarged. Probably. Whoa! Really. <laughs> Man, that's the rest wow, of your life yeah. right there. The drool-sickle, even if it's your, what if it's your uh, own yeah. drool, you know? Yeah, you just get that over with. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, that's just a that's just Ooh, a that's one-time true. thing. I mean, I, I will surely probably <laughs> puke after that, but uh, yeah, I can I can make it without the uh, the baby. But at physique, least it's but, done. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. true, true. Yeah. You can't take it back it, now, though, Jake, so for sure. that's it. It's done. The choice is yeah. made. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, yeah, it's bad. bad call. <laughs> All right, Jake. Well, well, I was just going to say, hopefully we don't see you actually head towards that. We want you to stay with the physique that you currently have. Jake is known for like being one of the best bodies in the world, gymnast ever kind of a thing. So I'm Mm -hmm. highly skeptical (laughs) that he would actually want a big baby body. Well, I was going to say maybe that's why he's okay with it. You know, he's he's had this body all his whole life like it, it it's okay yeah, if he doesn't Jake's have it biceps anymore. biceps are my quads. So, I don't think he's uh losing those anytime soon. Jake, thanks so much buddy for the time. Um really appreciate the insight into your career and what you got going on now. Um where can people find you? What do you got going on? Uh where's your gym at? You told us about your YouTube channel. Any other anything else you got going on right now that you want people and our listeners to know about? No, I think that's that's about it, man. I'm, uh, I think that's about it. So I I appreciate you guys having me out here, and yeah, pretty much just social media. And if you're out in Reno Sparks area, if I end up at Power Monkey and you see me there, man, just uh, love collaborating with people and and hanging out. So thank you guys so much for having me. Thanks, man. And can you let people know uh, where your social media accounts are so we can uh, point them in the right direction? Yeah, definitely. Um, both Twitter and Instagram is just Jake underscore Dalton. And uh, then you just same thing for YouTube, youtube.com slash Jake Dalton. And uh, hopefully I can see everybody there. Yeah, Jake, uh, thanks again. And I certainly look forward to seeing you back out at Power Monkey Camp once again. Um, for the listeners out there, guys, be sure to head over to powermonkeyfitness.com for services and upcoming events. Uh, check out our Instagram pages for regular teaching and technical content at Power Monkey Fitness, also at Dave Durante, and at Ollie Chad. Uh, we'd love to hear from you as well. You can always leave us a rating or review wherever you're getting your podcast or contact us with any questions or requests you have for the show by sending an email to podcast at powermonkeyfitness.com. 
On behalf of Power Monkey Fitness, we're your host. I'm Chad Vaughn with Dave Durani. And until next time, guys, thank you all for listening. <laughs>